Welcome to What Could Possibly Go Wrong? Coercing Arab Nations to Establish Relations with Israel with author and professor Assad Abu Khalil. Hello, my name is Grant Smith. I'm research director at IRMEP. Since 2015, the Washington Reports on Middle East Affairs and IRMEP have hosted an annual conference at the National Press Club uh, in which we critique US Middle East policy and in particular the powerful pro-Israel lobby right before the annual meeting of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee or APAC. And I'm rolling a few little clips from past conferences so while this year we could not hold this popular conference in person with all the hundreds of people, uh, we still have been gathering with top experts and you online to discuss how to transcend harmful policy initiatives, how to understand what's going on and work for better outcomes. And today we are excited to host our seventh extra webinar, What Could Possibly Go Wrong? Coercing Arab Nations to Establish Relations with Israel with Professor Assad Abu Khalil. The extra online series obviously does not replace our annual conference, but rather has provided an ongoing timely analysis until we can again convene in person and we'll have some major announcements in coming days about 2021 events and initiatives. So hang on for that. Before we begin, I wanted to give an important reminder in our conferences and webinars, in Q&A, in every aspect of this, we work to ensure our speakers, moderators, and attendees don't use this as a platform to perpetuate racist or bigoted behaviors or practices in our conference has always stood opposed to anti-Muslim, anti-Jewish, white nationalists, and all other forms of racism and expressions of bigotry directed at any person or group. Uh, we also reject the charge of anti-Semitism when it's used spuriously to silence legitimate criticism of Israel's policies and practices. So uh, our guest today, Professor Assad Abu Khalil, is a professor of political science at California State University, Stanislaus. He's the author of Historical Dictionary of Lebanon, 1998, Bin Laden, Islam, and America's New War on Terrorism, 2002, and The Battle for Saudi Arabia, Royalty, Fundamentalism, and Global Power, 2003. Our backup moderator today, who you can't see, is Sami Tayeb, the director of Middle East Books and More in the Adams Morgan neighborhood of Washington, DC. Uh, be sure to check out the wide range of books and other products at MiddleEastBooks.com. But importantly for today, Sammy's gonna pick up and keep things moving in the event that uh, I get disconnected or we have technical snafus and he'll pop in to relay questions from participants coming in via Zoom or email or Twitter. And so if you are in this Zoom conference right now, and there are quite a few of you, uh, you can use the question mode to send in questions at any time uh, so that we can ask. Asad about that. Uh, you can also email questions if you're on the YouTube stream to Israel Lobby Extra 2020 at gmail.com. Uh, and that is you know, right up here behind me. So in case you forget, uh, you can also ask questions by tweeting to hashtag Israel Lobby Con. Um, and so let's get started today um asking a question of uh Assad that we always ask which is when and why uh you first began reporting on these important issues you cover oh that's a very interesting question <laughs> <laughs> i did not expect to be asked uh first i have to say to you that i feel nostalgic 
to my years in Washington, D.C. in the 1980s, as I see behind you the logo of the Washington Report, I have been associated with Washington Report for many years. I've known the staff when I was in Washington. I knew the founders, uh, Richard Curtis and Kilgore, is that? The, yeah, absolutely. What's his first name, Kilgore? Andrew, is it? No, Andrew. Uh, and, Andrew Kilgore, yes, Andrew. passed away a couple of years ago. Right. Sorely uh, missed. Participated yeah. in all our conference planning meetings right up to the very end, just amazing man. Right, right. I mean, both have been where, I mean, sometimes I disagreed with Kilgore's, uh, you know, some of the writings and so on, the way he presented it. But I felt that there was such an energetic attempt uh, to bring about a strong, defiant challenge to the Zionist narrative in Washington, D.C. Well, let me speak about my involvement in this issue I covered. Well, first of all, for me, I, was, I started as a very young left-wing activist uh, very close to the Palestinian resistance movement in Lebanon. This is what I'm talking about when I was 15 and 16, uh, and I was very much drawn to the ideas of revolution by people like George Habash and many others and so on. And then I left Lebanon after the devastating Israeli invasion of Lebanon of 1982. Uh, so, I mean, for me, the issue is not intellectual. It is really personal and obviously emotional. I mean, uh, I never visited uh, the apartheid state, uh, the occupied Palestinian territories, uh, but the Israeli apartheid state visited me repeatedly during my childhood. I mean, I am originally from the southern city of Tyre, even though I grew up in Beirut. And it is without exaggeration that anytime we went to see my grandmother in the city of Tyre, where she lived in one of the oldest houses in the entire city, and uh, it, has, it was bombed directly three times uh, over the years, three times. It's now uh, in disrepair. Uh, there are signs around it. You cannot climb the stair to see uh, images of my memories and so on. Uh, Israel has repeatedly invaded Lebanon over the years that I was growing up. Every visit was characterized by an Israeli raid, bombing campaign, encroachment, uh, Israelis dispatched a team into Lebanon and kidnapped uh, Lebanese people and so on. Uh, Palestinian refugee camps were repeatedly, uh, you know, bombed from the air during my childhood. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I am somebody who, I was uh, 15 years old when Israel repeatedly bombed a refugee camp in southern Lebanon that doesn't exist anymore. People do not remember that there was a refugee camp in the city of Nabati which is in South Lebanon, because the repeated bombing campaigns by Israel rendered the place inhabitable. I mean, Israel literally incinerated uh, the Palestinian refugee camp in Nabati. So after miraculously surviving the Israeli invasion, where I came close to this repeatedly, uh, I came to America in 1983 and I was going to school at Georgetown at the time for my graduate degree. And uh, I lived in Washington, D.C. for several years. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, I taught at Georgetown. Uh, and then I went uh, elsewhere in America and came back to Washington, 1992, 93. Uh, so I have been around the Washington scene. And I have seen the Israeli lobby and its rivals. And I have seen how the rivals have been totally been defeated by... Right. Yeah, by an order of the Gulf government after 1991. And it is remarkable that there are still brave voices left. Washington Report is among them because Arab American organizations were killed. Uh, I mean, they were the allies of the Washington Report. You know, they had joint conferences together and the same people who attended the conference of the Washington Report attended the ADC and others. Right. I mean, all that have been killed because up until 1991, the Gulf governments invested in Arab American organizations because at the time, while they never contributed meaningfully to the Arab-Israeli conflict, they basically were upset by the Israeli lobby because it lobbied against their getting arms. And you know there were famous battles in Congress in the 1980s about Israel, uh, American arms sale to Saudi Arabia or UAE and so on. So mm -hmm. there were these clashes. The clashes between Gulf despots and the Israeli lobby were never about Palestine. Right. It was about Gulf despots wanting to get close to Washington 
and obtaining uh, you know, the arms purchases that they desired over the years. After the Israeli invasion of Kuwait, the American made a very clear bargain with the Gulf despot. It said, no more advocacy for the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. You cut off any funding uh, for the Palestinian organization, uh, PLO, and they were contributing money to the PLO, not in any way out of sympathy for the Palestinian, but particularly in order, one, to sway the PLO in a very conservative direction, which led us to the disastrous road to Oslo. And two, they were paying as a way uh, to save their necks. I mean, they wanted to pay the PLO leadership in order that no Palestinian organizations ever operated in Gulf territories. That was the bargain. After 1991, James Baker and the George Herbert Walker Bush administration told them enough of that, cut off all funding to the PLO, no more advocacy, and they were more than happy to start uh, the beginning of a honeymoon with the Israeli government and with the Israeli lobby. It started as early as then. Wow. So the announcement, the dramatic declarations about right. and so on. I mean, there's nothing surprising about that. And let us also remember- It's already going on. Covert collaboration, cooperation uh -huh. between Gulf despots and Israel throughout the 1960s and 70s. Remember, they both, just like today, they shared an enemy called uh, the Iranian government and its allies. They back then shared a common enemy, communism, socialism, and the government of Nasser. I mean, these governments were frightened that there was a man in Egypt preaching social justice, feminism, Arab unity, defiance against imperialism, and solidarity with third world causes. These were anathema and still are to the Gulf despots. So the Gulf despots were opposed to any real liberation movement throughout the region. They fought against them and they collaborated with America against progressive movements worldwide. I mean, the Saudis even contributed money to American covert operation against the Italian Communist Party because elections back then, talk about rigging elections. The United States repeatedly rigged elections in Western European countries to prevent the rise of the left. They were supporting the Christian Democrat in Italy. So the Saudis were aiding in that regard. And in the war in Yemen in 1960s, which the United States used just like the war in Afghanistan to exhaust and fatigue an enemy, and that then was Nasser. The Israelis collaborated with the Saudis in the awful war, uh, war in Yemen, in which the Western world, unsurprisingly, were on the side of the reactionary feudal monarchist forces along with Gulf regimes and Israel. And mm -hmm. Nasser was supporting a progressive Republican movement and secular movement in Yemen. Uh, so that's, that's the background to the story. Okay. After 1991, the Gulf government decided to kill Arab advocacy in Washington, D.C. Yeah. When you, mentioned, when you mentioned there was literal killing, would you include Alex O'Day uh, there in California where you are? Well, <clears throat> up until that point, uh, uh, you know, the Gulf despots were pretending that they support the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. and they would make financial contribution to Arab American organizations <clears throat> like ABC, National, NAAA, National Association of Arab Americans, even though they preferred the latter because it was more conservative and, and uh, preaching economic enterprise, capitalism, and so on. And there were attempts to create alternative Arab American organization like after 1967, Edward Said and Ibrahim Abulughad, among others, created an alternative progressive, and that is the AAUG, Arab American University graduate, even though I didn't like the scope of that organization because it only appealed to university graduates mm -hmm. leaving uh, behind all these Arab American workers in uh, the auto industry in Detroit and farm workers, Yemenis in California and so on. But that's a different story. So yeah, they killed Arab American organization and also it coincided with the rise of Islamic movement. So Sunnis and Shiites were less drawn to a secular Arab American organization mm -hmm. and they were forming their own uh, Islamist religious oriented organization. And I believe that to be, have been a, an unfortunate development because there right. is no doubt that when Arabs were organized along secular lines, they were far more effective as a force. They were not beset by sectarian religious differences and they really were able to center on the issue of Palestine. That is no more the case. Today there's fragmentation and not only that, you have now Gulf despot 
openly advocating for Israel. So as a result, if you want to speak for Palestine, mm -hmm. that organization does. If you want to speak out against the Israel lobby, you are on your own. There is no support. And remember, there were Arab embassies at the time who also supported Arab American advocacy like the Algerian embassy, the Iraqi embassy, and so on. And those are totally gone. None of them want to upset the Americans and the US government decide what is an acceptable cause and what is not. And certainly Palestine never was, is not today, and will never be for the American government an acceptable cause. What they yeah. want is in the name of the peace process is to smash Palestinian national aspirations. And I don't care if the government is Republican or Democrat, it doesn't make a difference to me. Well, we have plenty of time to get into this amazing, uh, amazingly detailed example that you give. Um, but I do want to mention, you know, I, I, this seems to be a recurrent theme. There was this incredible organization, the Organization of, of um, Arab Students, OAS, that came up in the 60s and was organizing conferences and was very dedicated, again, and what you say, the kind of a secular approach right. to pushing back against a lot of these policies. They didn't appear right. to be you know, they were talking to Palestinian groups and whatnot, but they did not appear to be the cat's paw of anybody. And, and of course, they were infiltrated and shut down. So right. it, it's an amazing... Uh, Grant, let me add to that footnote. You mentioned our organization for our students. Yeah. And not only they were sabotaged and they were infiltrated and they right. were fought and so on. It was a really radical organization. This was before my time, mind mm -hmm. you. I came right. to America, I was 23, and that was 1983. Uh, before my times, there was organization for American students. The story about this organization of Arab students was told in the book by Elias Shufani, who was a radical Palestinian intellectual. He studied in the United States, was active in the United States, and then went back and was an official in the Palestinian organization and then defected after uh, 1982 and was involved with more radical Palestinian groups and so on. So he tells the story. The man at the behest of Yasser Arafat who killed Arab student organizations fighting for Palestine was none other but than Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen. This guy basically said, we don't want Arab students organizing anymore. You know why? Because those students were criticizing the early signs of accommodationist solutions to the cause, uh, peace agreements with Israel and the, the two state solution and so on. They were very alarmed about that. And because Abu Mazen and Arafat were already planning that disastrous direction, they killed Arab students. They really killed that organization. And as a result, Arab students became splintered the way they are now. So you go on college campuses now, you find Lebanese student, uh, Tabouli, yeah, so yeah. you find uh, you know, Syrian organization, Moroccan and so on. I mean, it was fragmented. This was done by Mahmoud Abbas and by Yasser Arafat uh, on purpose. Uh, you also, what, what you also find today is that in addition to the fragmentation of Palestinian student act, uh, activism is that uh, uh, as a result of that, BDS came forward. BDS is really the alternative for the vacuum that was left by the dissolution, not only of Arab American organization on college campuses, but also of uh, you know, uh, the Arab student associations uh, of different uh, strikes. Okay, well, I just wanna add that the ADL also heavily infiltrated the organization of Arab students and another and a number of documents came out about that that uh, appeared on the electronic intifada but I really want to get the name of that book for the show notes because I've never heard of that and I'd love to read it if, if there's any, the, yes, any book? the book you quoted about um, about the, the disappearance of the OAS yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's um, funny. and there's a good documentary about his daughter about his life yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we want to get into, though, and I'm just going to put it up here so everyone can see it. This this really incredible article that you wrote uh, about today's topic, which is, of course, uh, normalization and this incredible drive that we now see for normalization uh, being led by the U.S., being led by Israel. So it was October 2020 over at Consortium News, the great Consortium News. It was titled the U.S. just blackmailed Sudan, and you go back into the history of U.S. Cold War intrigues in Sudan, um, and the piece was, of course, subtitled, Washington has proven that it is willing to make people suffer and even starve if governments don't acquiesce uh, to 
normalization with Israel. So I'm wondering if you could, again, to add to this uh, incredible detail you've just given, uh, talk about the Cold War history of the U.S. and Sudan and this shift away uh, to the point where now they're uh, in a normalization process. Well, uh, I mean, one of the myths about U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East is that the United States only visited upon the region and inflicted harm on them after September 11 in response to the bombing. The United States never left the Middle East to return to the Middle East. The United States has been in the Middle East since World War II, uninterruptedly. The United States is the official sponsor of the Arab tyrannical order. The United States, I mean, if you want to tick off reasons and causes for the perpetuation of uh, the lack of democracy in the region, there is no question that you have to put the United States and Western governments in the top of the list as factors preventing democracy. The United States not only does not support democracy in the region, the United States will fight tooth and nail against true democratization in the region. And I don't care whether the president is Obama or Trump, it makes very little difference. And whatever criminal aspect we complain about regarding the Trump administration and the cruel sanctions that are being inflicted on the Syrian people, the people, not the regime. I mean, American government always inflicted harm on people and presented it as if it is targeted, deliberately targeted against the ruler and his wife. I mean, the sanctions that are in name against Bashar al-Assad and his wife are really hurting the average population. I mean, I am sure, uh, you know, uh, the ruler of, of Syria is not eating any less, but the Syrian people are eating less food. They are eating less meat. They are having less nutrition uh, in their daily intake and so on. The same thing about the sanctions against Venezuela or against Iran and so on. It is always infliction on the people. And this started uh, throughout the years of the Cold War and certainly was uh, you know, uh, engineered to a higher degree of criminality by the Clinton administration with the massive savage sanctions that were imposed on the people of Iraq. And we all remember how Madeleine Albright, this liberal democratic voice on foreign policy, famously said that it was all worth it, even if it resulted in the death of half million Iraqi people. So in the Cold War, the United States was the official sponsor of most of the regime. The United States only fought and only brought up human rights and lack of democracy in government that did not toe the line. Any tyrant that follows US dictates and Israeli dictates would be forgiven for all their massive human rights violations. This is true about Morocco, true about Tunisia for all these years, uh, true about Egypt since 1970, true about Jordan, true about all the Gulf governments and so on. And it continues to this very day. Look at the Libyan dictator, Gaddafi, for example. Before 2011, for several years prior, because he surrendered all his weapons of mass destruction program to the American, he became very close to the Westerners. He was visited by uh, you know, uh, Condoleezza Rice, Tony Blair went and visited, and visited him in his tent. And we not, should not remember that he even dispatched the head of the secret police of Libya and was, meted, uh, was met with great fanfare and ceremonial bombast at the State Department when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State for Barack Obama. But of course, when the opportunity arose, uh, they could not resist and they brought down the government hoping to get a much friendlier client regime in Libya and look at the devastation of Libya. Obama has the blood of the Libyan people on his hand. This is one of the worst adventures of the Obama administration and of recent American policy. Look at the liberal media and their complaint about Trump. As much as Trump is responsible for so much of the uh, civilian suffering in Libya, in, I'm sorry, in Libya as well as in uh, Iraq, as well as in Syria, Iran and so on, but there's no question that uh, Obama and Bush launched more Middle Eastern wars than Trump. But if you hear the liberal media complain, you would think that things were so peaceful and so wise under the Obama and the Bush administration. So in the Cold War, the United States created a system of tyrannical regime whereby the United States would either finance or would finance and arm uh, you know, uh, Arab governments, or in the case of the Gulf, they would take their money and they would shower them with weapons, and they were dumping weapons throughout the Middle East on client regime. Look at Somalia. Uh, 
Somalia today, the war in Somalia, were directly the result of how this little small poor country was used by the US cynically during the Cold War against the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, the same can be said now about what happened to Libya, um, and how much weapons were dumped there. And the same about in Syria. I mean, uh, so the United States and Israel were involved in all our conflict, either instigating them or once they started, they threw heavily in them. The United States and Israel invested in the war in Sudan against the government of Sudan. They invested in the war in Lebanon, the long year of civil war on the side of the right-wing fascists. They invested, of course, in the Kurdish question in Iraq against the Iraqi government. Of course, they invested in the Iran-Iraq war as well because they wanted to bleed both governments. This is what a conflict that Henry Kitchener said that this is a conflict in which he wants both sides to be defeated. And that was a recipe for the prolongation of the war for eight years and the death of a million people and the injury of hundreds of thousands of others. I mean, this is the bloody history of America's involvement in the Middle East which started far longer than September 11. Sure, and, and in the case of Sudan, again, the point that you were making there, which I found to be particularly interesting is that in this most recent iteration of these trends where the US is never really supporting any sort of uh, grassroots or popular resistance, it's always on the side uh, of these entrenched forces. But um, you state that in the case of Sudan, they were under these crushing economic sanctions premised on the fact that the entire country, again, with the you know lower income uh, average person bearing the brunt of it, these incredible sanctions because uh, of Osama bin Laden's presence in that country for some period of time. Right. And, and, and so take us through this, this uh, kind of cynical, you call it blackmail, it looks like blackmail, uh, right. where the US is, is going to lift these sanctions in, in exchange for this favor. Right. Well, I mean, uh, the story of Sudan is an old one. As I mentioned in my article when I grew up, Sudan was one of the really uh, democratic countries of the region. It was one of the few true democracies in the Middle East, uh, because, of course, Israel was an apartheid and is an apartheid state that doesn't fit the bill of the democracy in the Middle East and so on. And Lebanon was quasi democratic, but Sudan was far ahead. And the intellectual life of Sudan was extremely impressive. And they had so many political parties competing from Islamists as well as the communists. And the Communist Party of Sudan in the 1960s was one of the largest parties in the entire Middle East. Uh, so after 1970, 1971, the communists were becoming much more powerful. They became a threat to the dictator of Sudan who previously posed as being a progressive ally of Nasser. But 1970, Nasser was dead. So as a result, many of these leaders that looked up to Nasser were fending on their own to try to stay in power by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. And they were basically uh, trying to sell themselves to the highest bidder. And the highest bidder was always the United States. So the dictator of Sudan, Jafar Numeri, imposed a draconian rule and massacred uh, any opponents of the regime, imposed a very tight religious government in the Sudan and so on. And that continued for all these years until he was overthrown in 1985. And the United States was very unhappy to see him gone. And then another dictator came in, and that's Omar Bashir, who stayed in power until uh, last year. Uh, the last year, there was a democratic movement in Sudan, and the people of Sudan were claiming for democracy. But the United States was not going to allow that to happen, because the military junta that rules Sudan is the guarantor for US and Israeli interests. And the military junta of Sudan collaborated with Israel and America since the 1980s. And the United States invest heavily in them. And make no mistake about it, Grant, we have evidence of that. Mm -hmm. The notion that Obama supported democracy in the Middle East in the Arab Spring, and I hate that title, of course, it's not an Arab Spring where there's blood in the street, uh, is absolutely inaccurate. The United States in the case of Egypt, the United States in the case of Tunisia, uh, actually banked on the military to take over power. They did not want a transition to election. They fought against it. And we remember how Hillary Clinton, when it was very clear that America's favorite despot, Hosni Mubarak, who once was called by Joe Biden family, uh, was no more able to stay in power. 
Hillary Clinton came with a formula in which it said he should be succeeded by Omar Suleiman, the chief of the secret police. This is like saying the best alternative to Hitler is Himmler, uh, that it would be a, a savior for the Iraq, for the German people. Uh, so then the Egyptian people wouldn't go for that. So then they had election. And of course, then the UAE and the Saudis, and there's no doubt with American wink and nod, uh, overthrew a freely elected, the, the first truly freely elected president of Egypt. And he was replaced by the general Sisi, who's in power now, because the military works very closely with the Israelis and the American. In Tunisia, they also tried to arrange for a military coup, but the chief of staff of the Tunisian army admitted that he was contacted by the American, but he said he wouldn't accept. And then there was elections. And of course, the Gulf the despots and the American manipulated the election to make sure the right-wing conservative forces. And Tunisia really has not changed much. I mean, the reins of power remain in the hands of the powerful, rich uh, you know, corporations and Western interests are still in charge of uh, the state of Tunisia. So in all those cases, and of course, in the case of Bahrain, the Saudi army intervened and crushed the rebellion there. So the story about bin Laden is interesting. Because bin Laden stayed uh, briefly for a couple of years in Sudan, mm -hmm. and he was kicked out of the country. Right. Uh, the United States found a reason to impose cruel sanctions on the people of Sudan because they said it sheltered bin Laden. Right. But bin Laden was sheltered for longer years in Saudi Arabia. How come there were no sanctions on the Saudi government? The Saudi government was an ally of bin Laden. There is not a single prince of Saudi Arabia, a king since the 1980s who has not known bin Laden personally. Bin Laden's terrorist activities in Afghanistan not only had the support and the blessing of the US government, but also of the Saudi government as well. So why is there no sanctions against the Saudis and the American government, which directly supported and sponsored bin Laden in his terrorist years when he was fighting communists in Afghanistan and elsewhere? Right. Uh, so they use that as a pretext. And in the negotiation over the last year, they made normalization with Israel a, pre, a, 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 a reason, a condition. Right. That there would be no lifting of sanctions until yep. you surrender to Israel. They yeah. did the same with Lebanon grant in 1983. They told Lebanon, we will not help Lebanon end its war unless it signs a peace treaty with Israel. And Lebanon did under duress in 1983. And that was uh, using a puppet right-wing government that Israel imposed in Lebanon. But the people of Lebanon, of course, revolted within a year, overthrew that government or basically made it impotent. And then the peace agreement was thrown into the dustbin of history. Uh, well, are, I, I want to just ask you something about that, because you're virtually the only place where I saw any reporting saying that there were Sudanese protests against normalization. Correct. You know, if we we're not at the point of overthrow yet, and they received no media coverage, Absolutely. I guess, unfortunately, because it was press TV, mobile video or something. Yeah. Um, I, mean, yeah. okay. I mean, the quality of Western reporting in the Middle East has been it's, pathetic. Yeah, and I hope we get to that um, because you had an excellent piece also on the profile of a, a better reportage in the region. But now I really want to go into depth because the normalization drive, right. you did you did something really interesting because it does have all of the attributes of a sales uh, pitch. And so you mentioned two polls that were being unfurled across the region and the first was very heavily used suddenly by Sky News Arabia across the entire region, the satellite network. And they were quoting Zogby analytic polls about the levels of popular support for normalization, you know, as if public opinion really matters across this region. And they specifically cited a poll and you wrote about it as well a Zogby poll of 1,000 Israelis and 3,600 Arabs. Suddenly, it was getting this coverage, but there seemed to be two major problems that you alluded to. The first was uh, that the figures couldn't possibly have been true and that they may not have been all that representative given the sample size. And I, I just found this to be, because I'm a big fan of uh, large representative polls, what was coming out of, 
um, Sky News Arabian as well, the Israeli press, was that there was this huge growing support for normalization of popular ties across the Arab region with Israel. And they were quoting 59% of Jordanians and Saudis, 58% of Egyptians, and 56% of residents of UAE support normalization with Israel. And I was knocked out by that because it was unlike anything I've ever seen, and clearly you were as well. And it turns out that they were flipping the results. They were actually uh, quoting the undesirable as the desirable. In other words, the majority of opinion, even in the Zogby poll, was that most were opposed to it, except for UAE. And so it was interesting uh, that, again, they made some quick corrections unannounced where they slotted in the Zogby figures showing majority opposition. But what you did, I thought, was something that doesn't happen very much. You actually went to the 2019-2020 Arab Opinion Index from the Arab Center for Research and Policy uh, Studies, which is a comprehensive poll. And just to compare it to the, the smaller sample size of the other poll, you know, almost 30,000 individual respondents, 13 countries, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, Iraq, all of these countries with an extremely small margin of error. And in your article, you said this uh, poll shows the real popular support for normalization. And in this case, the normalization uh, recognition of Israel enjoyed no popular support across the region, including you know, Saudi Arabia and some of the other countries. And the margins were much higher than the Zogby result. And the other thing that was interesting is this has been consistent year after year after year. Um, so I just want to ask you, you quickly saw something wrong with this. It looked like, uh, again, it couldn't possibly be true. And you made some comments about this. What, what do you make of these diametrically opposed polls? Well, I mean, polls are an instrument of propaganda in today's world. In other words, governments like the United States and Saudis and UAE, they are able to manufacture polls to sway public opinion, you see? I mean, that's the purpose of public opinion. Uh, I mean, public opinion can be used either to give you a reading of where the public stands on issues, but it can also be used in order to sway the public how they view things. And this is exactly what they did in the last few months. Just after the normalization was announced, suddenly, I don't know how fast they worked on that, right? They produced out of the blue two out polls, blue. one yeah. by the famous Washington Institute, which is the research lobby of the, uh, the research instrument of the Israel lobby. And of course, it was incongruence showing less support for opposition to normalization. And the Zugbi poll. But look, the Zugbi brothers have been doing business with the UAE dictatorship for many years. So uh, the UAE despots have been using Zugbi polls in order to reinforce their own policies and to justify them and to propagandize along the lines of their policies for many years. So I was not surprised how the Zugbi poll was used in this particular case. Uh, I follow public opinion surveys in the region for many years, and there is no question that the most comprehensive one, the most reliable by far, is the Arab Center one you just cited. Yeah. And it shows, it shows exactly what we have seen in public opinion surveys are even done locally, because there are also public opinion surveys conducted locally in Lebanon, locally in Jordan, locally in Egypt, uh, and so on. But also look at the methodology. For example, the Zugbi poll sometimes, uh, or even uh, the Washington Institute, they use a team of handlers to go to homes in Saudi Arabia and ask them, what do you think about normalization? And you have people from the, working for the Saudi government watching what you say, knowing that in your UAE and Saudi Arabia, if you tweet against the government policy, you can have a sentence of 15 years in jail. So the conditions in which the polls are conducted are not free. So that casts great doubt on their efficacy or reliability. But there's also another measure brand, which is 
Jordan and Egypt are the two countries with the longest standing peace treaties with Israel. Where does normalization stand in both countries? And both of them are not democracies even. Mm -hmm. The people of Jordan and the people of Egypt defying their own government have adamantly and consistently refused any attempts at normalization. Yeah. If, if you see in Jordan or Egypt an Israeli product, basically there would be a spontaneous boycott of your store. Uh, maybe they will burn down your store as well. Uh, look what happened in Egypt only two weeks ago. One Egyptian actor that I've never heard of took a picture with an Israeli visiting UAE. And the picture was posted in social media. There was a storm throughout the Arab world. He was vilified everywhere. And the Egyptian syndicates of actors expelled him. He was not allowed to act in any movies anymore or plays or serials and so on. And he was forced to even produce a statement, I'm sure he was lying, that he didn't know that the guy was Israeli and he was confused and so on because he was trying to find a way out of his own dilemma. That tells you where normalization with Israel stands. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much money and billions of dollars these Gulf despots spend in order to beautify the ugly face of apartheid Israel, the Arab people are not going to be misled and, and their minds about Israel is not going to be changed on the basis of the wishes of polygamous uh, rulers of the Gulf countries. Well, there's something interesting that was at the tail end of that, again, long and comprehensive poll that I just wanted to put up and get your reaction to it. And that is one of the major premises is that there's this widespread uh, view in the region that Iran is the top threat that's going to unify these days, these Arab uh, countries, the Gulf countries and Israel, because Iran is such a dire, dire threat. And again, in the poll that you used, which is much more representative and has a much, much lower uh, error rate, the uh, top threat across the country, across the board uh, countries are Israel and the U.S. And right. Iran is in a you know, somewhat distant third place. Um, right. what, so what do you make of the just utter uh, split between right. these rationalizations and particularly organizations like the Washington Institute uh, and the Foundation for Defensive Democracies um, trying to make this uh, stick? I mean, look, I mean, Gulf regimes today are close allies of the Israeli lobby. There's no question about that. I mean, the lobbies for Saudi Arabia and the lobbies for UAE in Washington, D.C. are mere arms of APAC. I mean, they work very closely together. The UAE ambassador is, uh, you know, uh, now out in the open in his alliance with the Israeli interests in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I have to say that the results of what you suggested have been proven before, which is polls after polls show that Arabs still consider Israel to be the biggest threat to them and the United States as well. Also, I want to add, because I wrote a very lengthy study a few years ago about the Arab Center polls, this most comprehensive survey mm -hmm. that I said is much more representative. They have their own problems as well. Like sometimes they, uh, they contract out some of the polls in some countries, like in Lebanon and elsewhere and so on. And I am not they don't have much confidence in some of these subcontractors that they do their work and so on. So, so there are some methodological problems, but in the absence of better alternative, I say right. this one is, as far as I'm concerned, the best measure of Arab public opinion today. Okay, well, I, and I also wanted to get into, uh, for whatever its faults, the reasons why the public opinion in the country is trending so strongly against normalization and this is what they listed in that. And maybe you can uh, reflect on whether it sounds accurate or not, given your analysis of the Arab Center. But they're saying uh, these are the reasons why they don't want normalization, particularly before a peace deal. The uh, colonialist nature of Israel, the racist expansionist policies, and the persistence of Israel in appropriating Palestinian land year after year after year. None of these sound crazy um what do you think these well, are the just yeah and, and and there's more i mean 
the memory of the dispossession of the Palestinian remains with every Arab who was born before 48, uh, after 48. Uh, I mean, this is an issue that still in the political and popular culture of the Arab people. And also remember, there is a blood record of the state of Israel. I am 60 years old today. And in my own lifetime, Israel has bombed the following countries, Tunisia, Sudan, Egypt, Somalia, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq. And in 1973, Israel ordered the downing of a civilian Libyan airliner. This is in my own lifetime. Israel has bombed all these countries, has bombed refugee camps throughout the region. And I mean, it is only logical, it is only rational that the Arabs do not look kindly at the state of Israel. I mean, early in the 1950s, mm -hmm. Hannah Arendt remarked in, a, in an article about the Arab-Israeli question, in which she said, Zionists, and you can add Americans, under successive administration, have always operated according to the dictum that Arabs only understand the language of force. Yeah. And Hannah Arendt said to Zionists, and she was a Zionist herself, right? Hannah Arendt said, even though she was a critic, but she said, if there is any lesson after watching few years of the Arab Israeli question, is that the one language that Arabs do not understand is the language of force. I mean, look how much massive violence Israel has inflicted on Arabs in order to subjugate them, in order to subjugate the Palestinian people, to squash their national aspiration. And it hasn't been successful, no matter how much massive violence they use, and no matter how much violence the US does, and no matter how much sanctions is used against the pop population. I mean, today, if you contribute money in America to a hospital mm -hmm. that is considered affiliated yeah. with Hamas, which runs Gaza, I mean, you yeah. will serve a long time in jail. Yeah. I mean, this is what the Israeli lobby has made. I mean, basically, the Arabs, by this American Zionist alliance, the Arabs are told the following, that if you resist Israel, uh, through arm struggle, you are a terrorist. No matter, even if you are only targeting Israeli occupation soldiers, you are a terrorist. And if you decide to resist Israel peacefully and verbally, you are an anti-Semite. I mean, they are giving Arabs no choice or even right. support, not only Arabs. I mean, look at uh, Jeremy Corbyn, even support of the Palestinians. They are giving out no alternative, BDS, has become an anti-Semitic method because it's boycott. I mean, when basically uh, critics of Nazism were the ones who pioneered the art of boycott of right. German goods. Right. I mean, that's what uh, BDS is really about, the peaceful boycott of the state of Israel. And this is why Zionism has become the biggest enemy of freedom of speech in most Western countries. They want to deny us the right to speak out against the state of Israel. And if we do, you are called anti-Semitic. Yeah, so it's um, it's interesting, and I, I don't want to pass up an opportunity. I mean, in, in terms of the U.S., we have the same problem with faulty polls year after year, and I include Gallup in that. Number one, they constantly claim that because they can find some support for Israelis over Palestinians in the U.S., that U.S. Uh, Americans also support massive aid packages to Israel. And what we found is that those claims cannot be supported. And so despite debunking 30 years of Gallup polls and doing uh, statistically significant polls where most people don't have an opinion, um, that is the majority opinion is they don't wanna take sides. We still hear year after year from Gallup that Americans support USA to Israel. They also, by the way, seem to support their right to free speech to boycott and um, the, that movement does not go against the grain. And so this effort that you talk about against Corbyn is obviously happening here as well. Uh, yeah. It's just a tremendous coordinated campaign. I want to get into a couple more things, though, um, about uh, the topic of the day, which is, of course, normalization. Um, so one of the um, other obvious premises, and you've mentioned it a bit, uh, is that normalization has carrots and sticks. You mentioned the sticks, which would be continued sanctions on Sudan if they don't do this. 
What about some of the carrots, like the F-35 fighter jet sales? Uh, yeah, I mean, the United States is willing to use its leverage, and its leverage either is punishment or, uh, or rewards, uh, in order to achieve its own aims and the aims of the state of Israel. I mean, now we, ask, we have to be happy that the UAE dictatorship, uh, which, is, which has become a really a regional uh, hegemonic force, I mean, the UAE today is engaged in war crimes from faraway places like Libya, in Yemen. Uh, they were involved in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, they are now having more advanced weapons given to them. And let us make it very clear. This is not entirely the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. Obama was not, not less a champion of arming these despots. And let us remember that the Yemeni war, this brutal war which created the biggest humanitarian crisis today on the face of the earth, according to the United Nations, was brokered by the Obama administration. The Obama administration was the midwife of the war in Yemen. So this attempt by Samantha Power or some of those uh, sudden critic of US foreign policy because right. it's a Republican administration, we remember your role. We remember Samantha Power's alliance with the Saudi ambassador of the United Nations. And I have the picture to show them. Well, it's it's interesting. Um, so, yeah, they basically ran out of bombs to sell wow. Saudi Arabia to drop on Yemen. And nobody's talking about that. And it's uh, it's an incredible lack of understanding about what's going on. So, um, you know, these normalization deals uh, and you raise this issue, the Abraham Accords Peace Agreement, Treaty of Peace, Diplomatic Relations and Full Normalization between UAE and State of Israel, that's the formal title of it, raised the question exactly, <clears throat> and I think you may have already answered this, but have the UAE and Israel ever really been at war in any sense of the word? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. I was just, <laughs> I was just about to speak about that because I made right. in Arabic on social media about that. Because not only they never were enemies before, but they were also collaborators under the table. But the funniest statement to me was the statement by the foreign minister of the UAE, who is the brother of the ruler and the half brother of the other ruler. I mean, uh, you know how it, how it works over there. Uh, and he made a statement in which he said, we are tired of war. We have been exhausted. And of course, young abs on social media were making fun of that guy. Because what has he done uh, against Israel? What was his contribution or the contribution of his ancestors in the wars against uh, Israel, of course, they were zero. Right. Uh, but but this is but this is a uh, in, a myth that is being woven by the Western media as well, not only the government. I mean, the Western media. Look how they label these peace accord. You know, long time enemies are right. Now, uh, Finally, coming to the bargaining they table, right? Want to, they want to make it more of an achievement in right. order to basically uh, enhance the credentials of the state of Israel that Israel is winning friends. I mean, they do something similar when they speak about uh, the Israeli alliance with the Sunni Arab world. I mean, what's Sunni Arab world? Call them Sunni despot. Uh, I mean, they should not even be called Sunni uh, despot. They should be called despot because, I mean, they do not speak on behalf of uh, any people, whether they are Sunni or non-Sunni or whatever. These are despots who are self-elected, selected, and they are only there because they are supported by the United States. I mean, Trump at least was honest during his campaign, but not afterwards, when he said those despots would not have stayed in power all these years if it wasn't for direct U.S. support. Well, yes. and he was also there in the White House at the giant list of uh, military hardware that exactly. you know, MBS was going to buy. So there was a refreshing honesty about the craven nature uh, of a lot of this. And, you know, the, the arms seem to be the carrot, but um, I guess we need to get into the the biggest questions, which are, what does the U.S. get out of any of this? Is the U.S. role simply to be kind of uh, a cat's paw for Israeli and uh, Sunni Arab designs? I mean, what what does the U.S. get out of any of this? I mean, Sunni Arab designs have nothing to do that. It's all about okay. it's all about Israel. Uh, and it just happens that these, uh, you know, Sunni rulers, Sunni in name uh, rulers, uh, uh, you know, are making peace with Israel and that pleases U.S. Congress. 
I mean, notice that uh, there is a bipartisan support for any peace agreement between the Arab despots and the state of Israel. I mean, Nancy Pelosi went even farther. She even expressed concern about uh, giving, selling <clears throat> to the UAE, not because the UAE is committing war crimes in Yemen, not because it's committing war crimes in uh, Libya, but she said she is worried about Israel. Yeah. Israel is a state that is guaranteed the military and technological superiority, not only against one Arab enemy, but against all Arab enemies. I mean, assuming that those despots are enemies. I mean, the only enemy that Israel has in the region are the people. And it is for that reason, Israel and the US will do their utmost to subvert the will of the people. Look what's happening in Sudan. In Sudan, after the uprising of last year, there was an arrangement whereby the military junta supported by the US and Israel told the civilian civic group in Sudan, we will rule together in an arrangement. But this arrangement now is being exposed and being fractured because it has become very clear that the military junta has no intention of sharing power with the civic group of Sudan, not with the uh, political parties that revolted or the youth groups. They want to monopolize power and do the bidding of Israel and the United States. And this is why there is rising criticism. There's a crisis in Sudan today. And it is for the bidding of Israel that the US Congress acts. And Donald Trump knew that because of the failure of the Jared Kushner plan for the Middle East, uh, let's call it that, the deal of the century, which went deal of the century, yeah. after, after a few days of its announcement. Uh, because of that failure, the Trump administration needed something to point to. They needed a kind of a diplomatic achievement to brag about, and they knew, and they were right, that at least this is an achievement between quotation marks, that even Democrats, even the stalwart democratic critics of Trump would not dare utter a word in its criticism, even though they are deserving of criticism, because of course, Democrats as, are as cowardly about criticizing Israeli apartheid and war crimes as Republicans are. I just want to mention something that in terms of the good guys doing some polls that the Washington Report published a poll we ran, and it showed basically that 68% of Americans, if they were given kind of the same deal of the century uh, of either taking an economic plan, if they were driven out of their homes and properties or uh, fighting for return, most Americans would have never accepted the deal of the century when purely given the question on terms of what it actually is. So no surprise that the region and the, well, that the Palestinians wouldn't accept it. But I guess, you know, here at the end, we have to talk about the Biden administration. Um, over at one of these nodes of the Israel lobby, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, they're heavily pushing <clears throat> the idea that Saudi Arabia has got to normalize next and that this is their last chance to kind of lock in this relationship, this unquestioning relationship of economic and military relations with the US, that if they normalize with Israel, the Biden administration is going to leave them alone. What do you think the Biden administration is going to be doing in the immediate uh, months about normalization? On, on the subject of normalization. Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, no question about it, uh, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, is facing domestic trouble of different kinds. Uh, he has problems within royal families. He has put most of his cousins under house arrest, mm -hmm. his uncles under house arrest. Uh, the king is, for all intents and purposes, is under house arrest, watched at all times by people who are loyal to the crown, to the crown prince. And uh, so he has to worry about his ability to uh, daringly defy all the traditions of the royal family and crown himself as king. It is a tall order that he is worried about doing it. And it is for that reason that he has hesitated. He has been hesitating to make it official as of this point. Uh, but he knows politics of Washington, D.C. very well. Let me give you a scenario, Grant. If Mohammed bin Salman were to fly, just like Anwar Sadat in 1977, into occupied Palestine, and if he were to deliver a speech calling for peace in the Israeli Knesset, 
do you have doubts that liberal and Democrats in the media, uh, conservative and Democrat, you know, all side, that everybody in Congress, even Bernie Sanders, will praise this initiative of the conference? I have no doubt. Personally, I mean, I know there are a lot of fans of Bernie Sanders. Personally, I don't think there would be one voice of dissent in showering praise on Mohammed bin Salman if he were to take that step. And I think personally, knowing what I know about the Saudi government, yeah. it's probably something that he is considering. And it is for that reason, he arranged for this secret meeting, not so secret meeting, I should say. Yeah, the Netanyahu. secret meetings are not secret, right? He is trying to preempt the Biden administration by polishing his pro-Israeli credentials. And yeah. the Biden administration, in my mind, will not mind uh, normalizing with MBS in return for normalization. And I'm sure they will make some cosmetic uh, you know, solution regarding the murder of Khashoggi. Like they will say, we beheaded two or three people that we thought were responsible and so on. Something like that, a face saving formula for both sides and all will be gone to past times. And let us remember that Joe Biden has been in this business for a very long time yeah. and he has kissed and hugged a lot of dis despots in the Middle East and he will go back doing that, just as Obama did, just as Trump did. Uh, it's a pretty um, pessimistic view, but I kind of expected that. Um, so tell, we've got some questions coming in. There are a lot of people saying, how do I follow Assad? Where can I get all of his great stuff? And some of them are asking, in particular in English, <laughs> where do people follow you? Right. I mean, I used to have a blog called Angry Arab News Service, which you can Google, but now it's defunct. I have migrated like most people. You see, blogs are not in vogue anymore. No. Twitter is the new thing. <laughs> so I have been very active in Twitter. If you write my full name in English, uh, it will take you to my Twitter account. And that's where I've been active. In English, I write for Consortium News a fortnightly article. And in Arabic, I write a weekly article for a long weekly article for the left-wing newspaper Al Akbar in Beirut, Lebanon. Excellent, excellent. Sammy, have we got anything coming in over email or some of the other channels, or should I just keep plugging through the questions in the Zoom? Um, well, there is a couple kind of, um, well, there was one clarification question. Um, someone was asking what became of the General Union of Palestinian Students, GUPS, um yeah. back in the day and then um and then someone was asking about henry kissinger and why uh he hasn't been more aggressively censured uh for being a the war criminal that he is in both latin america and the middle east but if you seek the nobel peace prize uh you need to be a war criminal so uh he did that just like the ethiopian prime minister right he won the nobel prize last year and after he was awarded the prize he has not you know launching war crimes against uh, Tigre in Ethiopia. Uh, on the first subject of general of Palestinian students, again, I mean, after Oslo, Yasser Arafat and his cronies basically decimated Palestinian activism in the United States because they don't want independent political activism. Instead, they basically were interested in having front lobbies on behalf of uh, the Oslo agreement and in close cooperation with the Israeli lobby. I mean, there was this uh, shop called the Task Force, Palestinian Task Force in Washington, D.C., which worked very closely with the PA and with Mohammed Dahlan and so on. It's now defunct. But for a while, they wanted those as alternatives. They don't want spontaneous political activity because they knew rank and file Palestinians are not happy with the humiliation <clears throat> of the Oslo Agreement, which basically created this corrupt government its only purpose is security cooperation with Israel, which basically translated as crackdown against Palestinian resistance groups and individuals in the occupied territories. So I didn't want to um, uh, divert us from looking at the governments, but for a long time, you've been also critical of Western reporting in the region and had some recent comments on what makes for a good regional reporter in terms of language skills their relationships with regional elites, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about that since you've recently written about it and have been thinking about it forever? Right. And I have received, uh, you know, uh, 
flack for writing about Robert Fisk. And I should say I was hesitant about writing on for, uh, Robert Fisk. I have been critical of Robert Fisk ever since I started my blog in 2003. So I don't want anybody to say that I suddenly waited until he died. No. I've been writing against him for many, many years. And after he died, I was approached by several people, friends and others, to ask me to write something about Fisk. And I said, well, I'm not sure. I wrote about him already and he's dead now. And my editor at the consortium news also asked me, and I said, do you think it's a good idea? And he said, yes. And we went back and forth and I was hesitant, but I said, okay, I'll do that. And that's what I did. Uh, I mean, Robert Fisk is a symptom of the larger problem. I mean, I don't want to make it all on Robert Fisk because I want to pay tribute. Yeah. Robert Fisk was one of the most courageous journalists who defied the consensus about Zionism and Western imperialism in the Middle East region. I don't that. Want to take that from him. I do not want to take that from him. Uh, he has been very critical of Western policies in Palestine, in Lebanon, and elsewhere. And I want to make it very clear. However, I mean, I have to assess him without emotional bias. I mean, if I want to allow my emotional bias, uh, I will say, well, he was supportive of the Palestinians, so I should give him a blank check. I don't do that. No, I don't do that. I feel we should be much more ethical in our standards and professional in our standards. I mean, it is for this reason, I mean, when we think about Palestine, how much we care about Palestine and so on, I don't want anybody to support Palestine. I mean, I don't want uh, indiscriminate recruitment for the Palestinian cause. I mean, certainly I don't want anti-Semite in our ranks in the Palestinian advocacy movement in the West. Absolutely I don't want not. Them. They no. don't belong to our cause and we want to get rid of people like that if they ever approach our ranks. And that's something that I think most people in the movement are very keen on. Absolutely. Uh, but the question of Western reporting is been nagging me for many years because the quality has been really going down. We do not have people who are either qualified to write about the Middle East or courageous to defy the consensus and the dogmas and the cliches about the Middle East. We have basically mimics of Thomas Friedman's school of journalism. People who go there with superficial knowledge. I mean- Interview again, the taxi driver. Right, right, right. And, and Friedman, in fact, is a step ahead because he did study the Middle East from his Zionist perspective and he was studied some Arabic. I mean, I mean, his Arabic is really like, uh, he can order a falafel sandwich, maybe. He can order falafel sandwich in Arabic, but that's the extent of his Arabic. But we don't have that anymore. We have people who have not studied the region in college. We have not, I mean, I ask them, I ask them question. I mean, uh, whenever they go, I mean, I ask Anne Bernard, Barnard, who covered uh, the Middle East from Lebanon and Syria over the years. I mean, when she got the job, I asked her like, what's your background? And she said, she studied uh, Russian in college and then she covered the police beat in New York City. I mean, no background whatsoever. And she went to the Middle East and covered Lebanon and Syria. And I think did a very lousy job doing it. And now she's covering something else in New York City. I mean, so basically they rotate correspondents. They don't have them specialized. Well, right. I have somebody who grew up reading names of people who covered the Middle East, like Eric Rouleau, Arnold Hottinger of Switzerland, people like uh, Peter Mansfield, even Patrick Seale, even though politically he was so uh, problematic. He, he, I mean, he goes through the book for the Saudi prince and he also was an apologist for the Assad regime. So, so I'm not happy with his politics, but his first book, for example, The Struggle for Syria is a classic for anybody who studies contemporary history of the Middle East region. We don't have people like that now. We, or, or Tabitha Petran. I don't want to forget this forgotten, unknown American left winger who covered uh, Lebanon and Syria for the Guardian for the, uh, in the 90, early 1970s and wrote a book that you can hardly find anywhere in store, even used bookstores, called The Struggle for Lebanon. People like that were really pioneers of journalism that I really learned from. Or even I.F. Stone, a name that people still don't remember, who went to Palestine to cover uh, the dispossession of the Palestinians and so on. We now have people who have no background who go there right. and just right. repeat the cliches that they heard before. Right. And not only that, uh, we have lazy journalism. When you go now as a correspondent, like say to the New York Times office in Beirut, you're gonna find available to you bodyguards, translators, drivers, and local stringers. They really do the job. And you basically know who to hire. They hire them all from the same political rank. They hire, I mean, I, mean, I know the names. I mean, they hired people from the March 14 coalition. People who are opposed to, uh, obviously to Hezbollah, people who are opposed to enemies of the United States, 
people who are aligned with the United States, these are their local stringers and they take their clues from them. So there is a problem in the Middle East. And also there is proximity to powers. I mean, these reporters, and that's including Fisk, yeah. he was very close to the people in power. People like Rafiq Hariri, Walid Jumblat, some of the most corrupt individuals who are responsible for the financial collapse of Lebanon. And yet, Robert Fisk was unabashed about his closeness to those people. So you got to stay away from the elites and you should at least right. invest in learning the language and history. Those right. seem like rather low bars. And I guess that's kind that's of, right. it's just kind I mean, of unfortunate, it's, but yeah. it's, yeah. So um, there's a question here. Um, and I don't know whether you've covered this, but it's saying how big of a commercial market for Israel are, is there in these Arab countries at present? Uh, you mentioned a little bit about demand, but I mean, that's certainly part of the sales job here. Is there a giant commercial market for Israel in these countries? Could be in the Gulf. And I'll tell you why that is, Greg. Mm -hmm. Because normalization in Jordan and Egypt is impossible, it has been impossible for decades, no matter how much government and U.S. pressures have tried to accomplish it. Why? Because both countries have history of unions, of some political activity, even the curtailed, uh, syndicates, uh, measure of civic society, even though repressed in both countries, in the, U in the UAE and Bahrain, none of that. Well, Bahrain, in fact, had an interesting history, but it was smashed completely by 1975 and when they abolished democracy because it was threatening to the rule of the royal dynasty there. Uh, so in the Gulf government like UAE, people are terrified. UAE is a police state. People are so scared over there. I mean, I spoke to people who were in prisons over tweets in UAE. I've spoken to them, mm -hmm. people I have met with, people I have known, and that includes friends. Uh, and one of them, after was released from prison, I mean, you will find a device in your home that you are not, uh, you are too scared to touch even. Suddenly you, are, you arrive back home from prison. So these are police states. UAE established a monstrous surveying agency modeled after the NSA, which they uh, utilized Israeli as Mossad assistance in constructing. And basically this is the ears and the eyes of the UAE in every home in the UAE. So in the UAE, not only there is official normalization, but basically uh, it, it's like there is, there is not only negative loyalty, like you never criticize the regime, but there is positive loyalty. You are required to voice support for the regime. I mean, I know people who are on Twitter in the UAE who are contacted by officials and told, you need to say this on, on that. I mean, these are uh, you know, uh, people who thought of themselves as independent intellectuals. Yeah. Uh, that's the extent of intrusion. So for that reason, like in the UAE, people will feel compelled to normalize. If there is a concert by an Israeli singer that nobody has heard of, UAE citizens will feel compelled to, compelled to attend because it is that kind of regime. This yeah, is a yeah. regime now that is not <clears throat> from Basist oppressive regime, by the way. I mean, it, if anything, it is much more sophisticated in its intrusion into people's lives because they have devices. I mean, the Basist regimes are very oppressive and intrusive, no doubt about that. But the UAE has the technology, the instruments of repression that were not available to Saddam Hussein and are still not as available, say, to the oppressive regime of Bashar al-Assad in Syria. So it sounds like there's going to be definitely <clears throat> a lot more sales into the military industrial complex, um, which has been a client and customer for a while. And um, they Israel directly as well. Right. But, you know, it, it seems like in the past, the recent past, you had these qualified industrial zones where Israel was going to ship cut pieces of textiles into Jordan and then Jordan was going to put them together and then they were going to sell them into the U S market. And none of these things seem to work. It's still uh, no, no, is it still happening? Okay. Because well, in, in terms of when I say work and this gets into my last question, the, the employment seems to be a lot of Bangladeshis being imported into the factories right. and, right. and, and no, you know, the, the promised jobs, for the Jordanians aren't necessarily there. And so right. it really leads into my bigger question, which is what's in normalization for your average 
Arab living in these countries that we've been talking about? What, what, what is there any upside for them? And, and, and if not, what should be happening? What's I mean, a better alternative here? Basically, it's an offense. It is a direct offense to your dignity and to your pride. It is an offense to your belief. It is an offense to your history and to your culture. And it is intended as that. And this is why there is an element of gloating in the Zionist celebration of those normalization, because they know it is being pushed down people's throat and they know it is being done against their will. And they derive a certain sick pleasure out of it. Israel has always derived a sick pleasure out of Arabs being humiliated by the government for the sake of Israel. Uh, the other element of that, of course, there is quite plenty to be derive benefit from uh, the Arab despots. I mean, you will get accolades, no matter how brutal you are, no matter how many of your people you kill and you oppress, you will always get accolades if you kill your people. Look at Anwar Sadat. I mean, Jimmy Carter, who undeservedly declared himself a human rights president, to this very day, he calls Anwar Sadat, who was a Nazi anti-Semitic despot, he calls him his best friend and his biggest inspiration in life. Do you think mm -hmm. that he would dare say that about Anwar Sadat if he did not normalize with Israel? Of course not. Yeah. That's what yeah. normalization will get you in America. Wow. It will get you glory and celebration and great honor in the capital. All right, well, the final question here is a little more forward-looking and hopefully optimistic. It says, uh, how would you encourage more Arab Americans to go into journalism instead of <laughs> becoming doctors? We need more Anthony Shadids. We rarely get Arab American uh, interns at our media outfit. What, what, so, second, I, it, it's, it's so amazing that you asked me about Anthony Shadid. I was just about to mention his name. Just say, look, you can make a difference. I have known... Anthony Shadid, when he used to be a not famous correspondent for the Boston Globe. Mm -hmm. And I used to live in Boston when I taught at Tufts University and so on. So, uh, and so when he started, uh, you know, he would call me and we talked uh, about the Middle East and coverage of the Middle East and so on. And then, of course, he became uh, well known, wrote for different newspapers, New York Times, Washington Post, and so on. And there is no doubt. Uh, I, mean, I don't want to speak too much about private correspondence I had with Tony Shadid, but I have to say that this guy was the only glimmer of hope I saw yeah. in the media, in the Western media of journalism after the 2011. And I know that uh, Tony Shadid, I'm not revealing a secret if I say, he was not happy about what is the way they were covering the region. He was not even happy about the choice of es experts. I mean, Grant, when I was in Washington, D.C. in the 1980s, uh, and even after the early 90s, like the New York Times, the Washington Post, if they spoke to somebody from the Washington Institute, mm -hmm. they get somebody from the Washington Report or from the ADC, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I remember one time, I read an article in the New York Times by the famous diplomatic correspondent, Jane Parles, and uh, she cited somebody from the Washington Institute. This is 19 maybe mid 1990s. And she did not mention that the Washington Institute is a research arm of Israel lobby or that right. it's an Israeli advocacy organization. And so I called her yeah. in the New York Times office in Washington. I said, don't you think this was a, a mistake? And she told, she told me, she said, absolutely it was a mistake and I should never do that. I mean, that's, that's how the standards were. Look at the standards today. Completely I did gone. a Times article today in the New York Times Washington Post and the people who are cited are one from the Washington Institute, which is never identified or labeled accordingly, right. pro-Israeli. One from the Foundation for Middle East, for the- Defense of Democracies. Defense of Democracies in the Middle East. For, yeah, yeah democracy. like a cloud, they envelop right. everything. Yeah. And mind you, they will have Arab point of views. They will get somebody from, an Israel, uh, from a Saudi lobby or from the UAE lobby or from the Washington think tank, like the Middle East Institute, which is paid and sponsored by Gulf despots. I mean, so you are basically getting a range of views that is one view, and that's yeah. the Israeli lobby. Yeah, uh, so what I'm saying is, Tony Shadid really tried to change that. He spoke to different people. I mean, I remember sometimes he would call me and ask me, who do you recommend to speak to? Because he was sick and tired of reading the same names of experts that are being cited uh, you know, uh, in the media, and so on. Yeah, 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 it's, I mean, 
it is a complete difference. And the whole story of the Washington Institute's founding by <clears throat> APAC uh, operatives and, and their donors is you just can't leave that out. And yet it is never mentioned. So, well, I want to thank you for your time. Um, this has been extremely valuable. We're going to be making a podcast out of it. We're obviously going to be um, putting a lot of these references below in the YouTube video, which will be up. Um, and so I want to tell everybody that you can certainly visit um, Israel Lobby or IsraelLobbyCon.org, which is our site for some of these uh, extra events that we've been doing in the webinar format. Uh, we're also going to be having a major announcement about what we're doing in 2021 uh, that'll be coming out quite soon. So if you're not signed up for any of the email lists that are down below in the YouTube video description, you should sign up for those so that you can be alerted of great uh, speakers like uh, Professor Abba, Asad Abu Khalil and others who've come up and uh, the digital media that's going to be available from now on. Um, so please do visit wormia.org, irmep.org for our next uh, big thing, which we'll be announcing soon. And thanks to everybody for joining this uh, extra. And is there anything else you'd like to say, Professor? Um, no, but I am very optimistic, especially after 2006 of the war in Lebanon and the humiliating defeat of Israel, that the balance of forces have dramatically changed and that Israeli military supremacy is mm -hmm. not what it used to be. And I have to say, anybody who is uh, suffering from political depression should draw the lessons of Israeli humiliating performance, whether in Gaza or Lebanon, to realize that the future does not look as grim as it seems to be, uh, according to the wishes of the propaganda of Gulf Despots or Israel. Okay, well, the battle's shifted on the other terrain. Thank you, sir, and we will uh, certainly be in touch in the future. Thank you so much.